Oh, here's your dad, I bet. How are you? I'm Pastor Mike. I'm Bob Nelson. Hi, Bob. It's good to meet you. It's good to meet the guy that's responsible for this guy. What a innocent. What a the great milk, guy, milk though. Man. He's, man, he's yeah. a great guy, I tell you. I love your son. <laughs> well, I'm. <laughs> I'm glad uh, to be with you today uh, as we celebrate Bill's life. And uh, I know many of you have known him all your life, uh, some for part of a good part of his life, and uh, myself just uh, four or five months. And, but I loved Bill and really enjoyed uh, who he has become. And so today we gather uh, and we grieve because we love. Grief is a part of love. It's a reflection of that. If we didn't love, we wouldn't grieve. Uh, but we also grieve today as a people of hope. Uh, because Christ was resurrected from the grave, we know that there's life after this life. If Christ had died and never been resurrected, we wouldn't know for sure. But because of his resurrection, we know there's life after this life. And so Jesus told us uh, that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. And so because uh, Bill believed in Christ as his Lord and Savior, we come together today knowing that this is not the end. That Bill has walked from this life into the next life. And so today, even though we grieve, we come together to celebrate his life. And so in the service today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to share some memories of Bill. And, uh, and when you do that, I'm going to have Dawn uh, bring a mic around just so that we can record those memories uh, today. And so as we begin this service, I'd like to ask Dawn if she would open us in prayer. And then Dawn is going to read the 23rd Psalm. Let us pray. Our dear and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you on this day in your house as your people to celebrate the life and the character and the person in Bill Holloman. And Lord, we celebrate the promise of eternal life and we hold on to that during our time of grief and uh, the days and weeks and months ahead, Lord, that today is not the end, Lord that you have more in store for us and more promises than we can ever imagine. And Lord, we thank you for uh, loaning us, Bill, and letting us celebrate his life and the love that he had for his friends and his family. Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and move amongst us. And as we share memories of, of the person that he was, Lord, that you would give us wonderful recall and just warm our hearts as we celebrate his life today. And Lord, uh, most of all, we celebrate the promise of eternal life, that uh, hope and that guarantee that we have for those who believe in you. And Lord, now we ask for your presence to be with us during this celebration. In your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please now hear the word of our Lord in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, 
for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you, Dawn. So this scripture is written by David, and he was a shepherd. And so in the summertime, uh, when the sheep would eat the grass and the low-lying areas, and it had run out, they would take the sheep into the high areas of the mountains where there'd be fresh pastures. And uh, the shepherd would lead those sheep up into the high pastures, and they would often go through ravines. And it was in the ravines that the sheep were uh, subject to predators. They would be trapped in a ravine. There's no place they could go. But as long as the shepherd was with them, they were not afraid. When the shepherd was with the sheep in those ravines, he was the, their protector, and he would give them comfort and peace. And so David is using this picture of uh, going through these ravines of us passing from this life to the next. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And what that tells us is that the moment uh, when Bill, that afternoon on Thursday, when he was cooking a meal, preparing a meal for Erica and Robbie to come over and share with him, uh, he sat, he was sitting in his wheelchair. And at that moment, when he drew his last breath, he wasn't alone. Jesus Christ was right there and had a hold of his hand and walked him from this life into the next. And so there was nothing at that moment that Bill was afraid of. He was set free at that moment from his body that ached, the pain in his back. He was set free from things he had done here and decisions he had made that had hurt himself and others. And he was walked into a new life. And so uh, this scripture holds that promise that for all of us who trust in Christ, that when we draw our last breath, we won't make that journey alone. And it says that one day my cup will overflow again. And that's actually a promise for each one of you to, you grieve today. And there'll be occasions when you're going to miss Bill. You're going to see things that will remind you of him or smell something that will remind you of him. And on those days you'll grieve. But eventually, when you think of Bill instead of grief, you'll smile and you'll laugh. And that's when we know that our cup overflows. And so this is Christ's promise that he was with Bill at those moments, but it's also Christ's promise that he will be with you in the days ahead. Um, you know, I don't want to gloss over uh, that Bill made decisions that I know he regretted. He made decisions. He didn't love people the way he should have or many years in his life. Um, and I know that because of that, he's hurt his children and others. Um, but in, these, in this last year or so, in my interaction with Bill, when I've known him these last several months, I saw him loving in a different way than he had in the past. And I saw regret in his life, that he hadn't done this sooner, that he hadn't learned sooner how to love and to be the person he should have been. But our God is a God of second and third and fourth chances, and God never gives up on us. And what I'm thankful for is that Bill finally came to a place where he made decisions in his life and how he was going to love other people that brought peace to him and brought enjoyment to the people around him. And I know that his regret would be he would love to be able to do life over, to be able to do it different the way he's been living it recently. Um, but you know, how we live our lives does not determine if we're in heaven or not. That determination is based on our trust in Jesus Christ. Because all of us fall short. All of us do things we shouldn't do. And thank heavens, God doesn't weigh any one of our lives in the scales to say, are you good enough? Is this person good enough to get in heaven? Because none of us would get there. But God offers forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ. And so today, I want to take a moment and celebrate Bill's life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read his obituary.
And as I read that, I hope that uh, memories of Bill will come to your mind. And after I read that, I just want to open it up for us to sh maybe share a few of our memories of him. And so uh, this is Bill's story, as brief as this part is. William Milligan Holloman, age 67 of Lanark, died on Thursday, November 16th at his home. Bill was born on February 25th, 1950, the son of Russell and Jesse McBee Holloman in Elizabethtown, Illinois. He was raised in Dixon, Illinois, and attended Dixon High School. Bill proudly served his country in the United States Army during Vietnam. Bill was an open, warm, and generous man. He was a caring person and was always willing to help others. He loved to tinker with small gas engines, enjoyed working on cars and trucks. Bill was also a wonderful cook and enjoyed baking. And most of all, Bill cherished spending time with his close family and friends. Bill will be dearly missed by his two sisters, Leah and Albert Farrell Shelton of Mount Morris, Darlene and Dennis Howard of Dixon, and one brother, Roger Farrell of Dayton, Ohio, 10 children, three close friends, Carlene Clausen of Malden, Illinois, Erica Marillo of Shannon, and Robbie Nelson of Lanark, and all of his other friends in the community. Bill was preceded in death by his parents. So uh, I love to tease Bill whenever I had the opportunity. And so we were having a Bible study at his house on Tuesday evenings. We'd had two of those uh, just prior to his death. And so the first one, uh, Bill was always talking about how I liked to bake and uh, that he was a good baker. So at that first uh, Bible study, I was razzing him and telling him, I bet you don't know how to bake. I'd like to see you. You just show me. You talk, do all this talk, but you show me. So the second Bible study that I came, he was so proud he had a pecan pie in the oven. And so when I came in, he told me he had to fix the pecan pie for that night uh, for our Bible study. And I told him, I said, oh, I bet you just bought that at Baker Square and just probably threw it in the oven. But uh, he served that pecan pie and Robbie said it was the best crust. Robbie doesn't normally eat the ends of the crust around the outside of the pie. And Robbie said it was the best crust he had ever had. And that pie was great. Uh, but I really loved Bill. Uh, he was always, from the very first moment when I met him, he was open to talk about his faults, open to talk about what he'd done in his life, open to talk about his regrets. And um, in him, you know, I didn't know him before this last four or five months, but in him, I saw someone who had changed, who God had transformed into the person he really should and could have been all along. And uh, so I saw a man that was happy. Uh, probably had regrets, but he was happy with where he was today. And his connection with Carlene, uh, who they shared life together as good friends, close friends, and talked about hopes and dreams. Uh, with Erica, that he treated like a daughter and called every single day, numerous times throughout the day, I think. And then this guy right here, Robbie, that uh, if it hadn't been for Robbie, Bill told me, he said he'd been, he wouldn't have made it. He would have been back in prison or dead. And he said, because of this guy, Bill was experiencing the life that he was today. And uh, so I'm, I'm thankful to have got to know Bill just for these short months but it created an ache in my heart when I had found out he passed away. And that ache comes from love. And so I want to give you an opportunity. If you have a memory or a story or something about Bill, uh, whether it'll make people laugh or whether it'll bring tears, I want you to share that if you would. Just raise your hand if you have a memory or story. Let me tap it. Yep. <laughs> So share a memory or a story. Everybody's shy. Come on. Well, the one well, no, I, I, don't, <laughs> I really don't need this. Yeah, Bill would, ask, Bill would like you to share a story. Okay. Bill would give you the shirt off his back and he'd come back and get it. <laughs> but he really would give you anything. He really would. He was a good person. He wanted to be a good. He tried to be good, and he was good this last round. Yeah. I mean, he was good. 
and I wanted the whole family to know it too, because Bill really had changed. I seen it, I grew up with him, and I know he had changed. And he loved Carlene dearly. And Erica and Robbie were like his own children, and they took very good care of him. And I am so happy that Bill had you people, because evidently the rest of us was not getting it right. You guys was getting it right because Bill really was turning his ways around. And God bless him. Other memories that you have of Bill or good times that you shared together? Story Hi, about... Robbie. Talk about the, the rocket accident. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then just hold it closer because we're going to record you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just hold it closer so I can hear. Okay. So we were going up to Rockford. It was Labor Day weekend. We were going to, was it? LKQ. LKQ. Pick up parts for like car and stuff. So I missed the turn, turned around in an empty parking lot. And I pulled out. I didn't even see her coming. And she smoked the front end of the car. <laughs> so, we, so we were up there about three hours waiting on the police and all that stuff. So you know, it was all right. And as soon as I turned my head and go, Robbie, she laid down. So, <laughs> yeah. Did uh, what, how Bill react to that? He was fine because she'd come out and <laughs> and Bill goes, what are you freaking out about? It happened too late now. He put a call into the situation, and I guarantee you, she would have been real mad if he left her out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. He was my buddy. What did you admire most about Bill? Honesty. Honesty. He was honest about everything. He never denied. Whether. Uh, <laughs> whether it was good, bad, or indifferent, so. Uh -huh. Come on, Erica, you got something to share. Um, me and Bill have been through a lot for many, many, many years. And, um, I haven't talked to him in a long time, you know, and I went through my, my whole prison stay and I didn't hear one word from any of my family not one letter not one phone call nothing and out of nowhere Bill came back into my life through Pastor Mike and I am I am just so blessed now because of Bill you know, I, I don't know, I can't even talk, but I actually think that I'm going to make it this time, and it's because of Bill. He's a good inspiration, isn't he? Good inspiration. Carlene, what is it that you specially enjoyed and re admired in Bill? Well, he used to call me sometimes 15 times a day. <laughs> and up on my phone, it, it would sh show Holloman. And my grandkids would say, Grandma is the hollow man again. <laughs> hollow man. <laughs> He's a terrific his, uh, that phone for him was his lifeline to people, wasn't it? It was. Uh-huh. Has it always has? Uh, other memories or stories that you might have of Bill? I'm sensing something over here. I'm not going to pick on you again. That's why you yeah. I'll point back here. I can't do it. I just thought of him years today because he loved Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh, he would have been cooking up a storm, yeah, wouldn't he, at Thanksgiving? Times. Yeah, oh, poor one. I know. He always loved to come for Thanksgiving meals. I thought of him then really bad. 
Yep, I'm going to bring that up. Yeah. So one of the uh, scriptures, images Jesus uses of heaven, he says it's like a banquet table or a banquet hall. So we think about Thanksgiving, how people get together, friends and family, and maybe people you haven't seen for a while, and you talk and you catch up, what's going on in your life, what's happening, how are you doing? And Jesus said, that's what heaven's like, like the wedding banquet. And, you know, when Bill took his last breath and Christ was holding his hand, he walked him into that banquet hall where all those saints have gone before us. And he sat him down at that table. So when we were having Thanksgiving meal, Bill was sitting down at the banquet table having Thanksgiving meal with all those who've gone before him. And it's those kind of images Jesus gives us for hope. He gives us those images, not... Um, just to share something, but he wants us to hold on to those that this is what heaven's like. And so the first scripture I want to share with you, thank you, Don. The first scripture comes from John 3.16. And I alluded to the fact that how we live our life, God, thank heavens, doesn't weigh our lives in a scale of good and bad to see if we make it to heaven. But this is what God says, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. And so this reveals the truth to us that it is not how we live our lives that determines whether we receive life that lasts forever. But it's our trust in Christ and God's love in essence. God says, I'm giving my own self, my son to you. This is how much I love you. And I believe at the moment when Jesus was being nailed to the cross and his arms were being outstretched as they laid him on the cross, and nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. At any moment, Jesus could have stopped that. He could have called down 10,000 angels and stopped what was happening. But because Jesus was God himself, who knows the past, the present, and future, I believe at that moment, all of our faces, including Bill's, went through Jesus' mind and flashed through his mind. And when Jesus saw Bill's face in each of ours, At that moment, instead of calling down the angels to take him off the cross, Jesus said, I love Bill and each one of us so much that I'm going to go through this cross and go through this horrendous death. Because Jesus knew he'd be resurrected, but he had to go through the cross for that to happen. And he says, this is how much I love you. I'm willing to do this. And that's what God says. If you trust in that love, that God loves us that much, then we are assured life forevermore. So another image that God lifts up is this from John 14. It says, this is the night before Christ is going to be crucified. He's having a meal with his disciples. And uh, imagine if you, if we were having a last meal together with people you love, At that meal, if you knew tomorrow was your last day, wouldn't there be some important things you wanted to share? I mean, if I knew tomorrow was my last day, I'd be gathering my family and the people I love together today, and I'd be saying, these are the most important things I want you to know. And so this is a setting for Jesus here. And he says, he tells his disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas, one of the disciples said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So there's several promises in this scripture. One, 
God says, in my Father's house, in heaven, there are many rooms. So there's room for all of us. There's a place for all of us there. And Jesus said, and I think it's interesting that Jesus was a carpenter. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So the carpenter, when he was resurrected to life here on earth and 40 days later went into heaven, at that point, he was going to heaven as a carpenter to prepare a place for each one of us. And so I believe that of all the people that knew Bill, God knew him best. God knew the things Bill loved. They knew, he knew what things would please his heart. Jesus knew that. So as Jesus went up there to prepare a place for Bill, what would that room be like? What would be in that room he's prepared for Bill? Pie crust. Pie crust. I, there had to be a kitchen. It has to be a kitchen. There had to be a kitchen. He, a place where he could cook and bake. And he loved having people over to share a meal with him. He loved sharing what he had and his life together. So I can see, I also think that kitchen had a table in it where not only would he bake but it, and cook, but it'd be a place that he'd sit down with. And so Jesus, I believe, has prepared a place for like that. He also loved cars. He had so many car magazines, newspaper magazines, and looking at those, and whenever, when we were looking for a car for Erica, Bill was the one that was on the phone tracking down vehicles, seeing how they were. I bet that place that Jesus prepared for him has got a garage on it, too. <laughs> he could sell you insurance. He could sell you insurance. So, you know, I think he's going between this garage and this kitchen. Because heaven, we're going to be able to do the things. It's as real as it is here for you and I. We will see people that we love who've gone before us. We will interact with them. We will share life with them. And God says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So the amazing thing is, none of us deserve this. None of us deserve it. But God offers it to us and says, because I love you, this is for you. And all we have to do is trust in that love that Christ showed for us on the cross and ask him to come into our hearts to receive that love and to receive Christ and say, make me into the person you want me to be. And that's what Bill was experiencing. And so I want us to sing a song. So let's grab some hymnals. We'll hand some to you in the first row. So we're going to sing Amazing Grace. And so, uh, so, I'll lead you in singing. So it's number 299. So this uh, grace is a word we use in the church a lot, but it's not a word that's very easy to understand. We could replace the word grace. It means the same as love. Amazing love. So this very first song, verse, amazing love, so number 299, page 299, amazing love, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Bill, he knew and saw the wretchedness in his life of decisions and mistakes he had made. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Sometimes when we're going through life, we don't see the truth of what life should really be like. We don't see God for who God is. We're blind to God's presence in our life. Touch. That's right. And, touch and it's not us that finds God, but it's God that finds us. And that's why the writer says, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. So let's join in singing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. 
was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. What a wonderful song that reminds us of God's love and grace that finds each one of us. So the closing scripture I want to use is another image of heaven that I love. And so uh, in the Bible, there's a, a book of the Bible called Hebrews. And there's a chapter in that book, chapter number 11, which is naming all the faithful people who have trusted in God. And Bill, I believe, would be one of those people listed in that chapter today. And after all those people are named, chapter 12 that comes right next says, Therefore, Referring to all these people who have just been named, all the faithful who have trusted in Christ. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, referring to all of those who have died and gone before us that are faithful. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us run, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, for who the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So the writer here is using imagery of an Olympic stadium. He's used an imagery that we have this great cloud of witnesses who've gone before us. And I believe that the present day heaven where Bill is today is a lot closer to us than it is far off. I actually picture around the edge of this roof that right now Bill is that close, that he can see us. It says there are a cloud of witnesses. For them to be a cloud of witnesses, they have to see what's happening today. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles. Let us set aside those things that catch us up in this world, that make us trip up, and let us run the race with perseverance. And so right now, what would Bill be doing in that stands? He's stepped off the racetrack of life. We're still on that track. He's walked up in the stands, and I picture him turned around with his fist in the air, cheering us on. And saying, run, run, run. Keep your eyes focused on Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who can bring us into the people we're supposed to be, to make us who we're supposed to be. And Bill learned this late in life. But he would be cheering us on and say, learn this now. Focus on Christ. Run the race that God set out for you. Run it as hard as you can. And Bill's going to be cheering us on. And so we think about, you know, we aren't going to see Bill for a while, but he can see us. He's in that great cloud of witnesses. So my hope is for each one of us that who he was here in the end inspires each one of us to run that race with perseverance, focusing on Christ who stands at the finish line 
the one who will make us into the people we each desire to be. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for Bill's wonderful life here in these last years. Lord, we thank you for his love that he's expressed to so many gathered here. And Lord, we thank you for forgiveness for times when we stumble and when we fall. Lord, we thank you that you are the God of second and third and fourth chances, that you never give up on us, that you have a promise and a hope for eternal life. And Lord, we thank you that this world is not all there is, that there is heaven that we can look forward to, that banquet hall where one day we'll see Bill again. Until then, Lord, we pray that you would hold each one of us here. I pray that you would comfort us in our sorrow, that you would give us peace, and that you would make each one of us unafraid to face the future. Lord, draw us closer together here. Enable us to love one another more faithfully. Enable us to run that race with perseverance that you've set out for us. Let us run that together. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of Bill's love and his life. As we now join in that prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to drive out to the cemetery. My brother Matt is going to lead us with a gray van. Uh, we'll go out to the cemetery. We'll place Bill's urn in the grave. We'll cover up his uh, urn right then. If you want to help, I'll have a shovel there where you can take a little bit of dirt and dump it on his urn. And then we're gonna, I'm going to share a brief prayer. And then the ladies downstairs have prepared a lunch for us of sandwiches and a salad and so on. And uh, we can all come back here and have lunch together and share life together. May the grace of our Lord and Savior be with each one of you and bless you with his presence. May God's love shine in your lives and shine through you to others just as Bill did here lately. And may through the Holy Spirit, may we each experience a joy and a comfort in the days ahead. Amen. Matt will lead us out to the cars in just a moment.